Welcome everyone to tonight's policy and practice seminar entitled Free and Fair, the State of Election Integrity in America. Our goal for this evening is to parse the origins and implications of heightened concerns about the integrity of US elections following an election year 2020 in which many observers have suggested that America's democracy was put to the ultimate stress test. We're fortunate to be joined by an absolutely fantastic panel to help us navigate this hugely important topic. First, we have Sarah Isgur. Uh, Sarah is a staff writer for The Dispatch, a professor at George Washington University, contributing editor at Politico, and an ABC News contributor. She most recently served in the Department of Justice as the director of the Office of Public Affairs and senior counsel to the Deputy Attorney General during the Russia investigation. Next is Megan McArdle, who is a Washington Post columnist and author of The Upside of Down, Why Failing Well is the Key to Success. Previously, she was a Bloomberg View columnist, and Megan wrote for uh, The Daily Beast, Newsweek, The Atlantic, and The Economist, and founded the blog Asymmetrical Information. And last but not least, my friend and former colleague, Matthew Weil, is director of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Elections Project, where he is responsible for all the organization's voting-related policy development efforts at the state and the federal level. Prior to BPC, he served at the Election Assistance Commission and was a staffer at the American Enterprise Institute. So each speaker will have about five minutes to start, and then we'll have a discussion between the four of us before we open it up to Q&A. Please, again, put your questions in the Q&A feature as soon as you like so that Abby can start collecting them. And the seminar will end at the latest by 7.15. Uh, so now, now let me turn it over to uh, Sarah Isger for some opening remarks. I just want to start, I guess, by challenging some of the shibboleths on each side of this conversation. So we just had the primary in Texas. Uh, that was one of the states that was listed as a, one of the 19 states that had passed laws uh, intended to suppress votes post-2020. And what we've seen is, regardless of the intent behind those laws, it certainly didn't have its effect. You know, primary elections are notoriously low turnout affairs. Texas saw actually a substantial increase in primary turnouts on Tuesday compared to 2018. Uh, in 2018, 1 1.5 million Republicans turned out, a million Democrats. And this time in 2022, we had 1.9 million Republicans turn out and just over a million Democrats. So percentage-wise, a healthy increase in the numbers. We saw that increase uh, really across the board, early voting, in-person voting, etc. So I want to take that and ask why we're seeing sort of a upswing in turnout in voting at the same time that Republicans are saying we have rampant voter fraud and stolen elections, and Democrats are saying we have Jim Crow 2.0 uh, happening in a lot of these states. So first of all, I've worked in three presidential campaigns, innumerable statewide campaigns, and I've written a lot about how it is, to my knowledge, uh, impossible at this point to steal a statewide election. Obviously, a lot of this was litigated between uh, the election day in 2020 and inauguration day, well, January 6th, really, in 2021, rejected by Trump-appointed judges and other judges, and not just on standing, on this idea of who could sue, but really even on the merits. We had a two-day hearing in Wisconsin where a Trump-appointed judge heard all of the evidence about uh, voter fraud and just found that there was zero credible evidence at all. Um, when it comes to adding ballots, subtracting ballots, changing ballots, the only thing that has really ever worked is taking absentee ballots either from a um, neighborhood that you know favors your opponent and simply taking those and putting them in the trash. Again, something that might get you uh, approximately a thousand votes. And the most recent example of that, 2018, in fact, a Republican campaign, uh, the consultant was indicted and convicted for activities related to absentee ballot collection harvesting. Um, and again, we're looking at around a thousand ballots, just not nearly enough at that statewide level. And in order to have that multiplier effect because of the way state elections are run in the United States, you would have to have so many people in that conspiracy. Okay, so let's put that aside that the Republican thoughts on stolen elections simply do not have evidence for them right now. It doesn't mean that there's not some balance to be struck between election security um, and making it easy to vote. But the idea that, for instance, 2020 was stolen or we have rampant election fraud and statewide elections are being changed, 
There's just not evidence for that. On the other side, though, you have Joe Biden saying that 19 states have um, passed voter suppression laws, have made it easier to change the outcome for partisans to actually just steal elections on the other side, uh, that this is Jim Crow 2.0. I want to break that down a little as well. So, for instance, when Joe Biden gave that speech in Atlanta and he mentioned 19 states, he failed to mention that four of those states were run by Democratic governors. So either Democrats are also uh, believing that the election was stolen from Donald Trump and trying to suppress votes, or there's something else going on here. The data we have isn't quite right. And when you actually dig into what these 19 states have done, it doesn't quite match with what you're being told. So uh, for instance, we have, um, states that in Georgia, let's start with that. Georgia has 17 days of early voting, including at least two Saturdays, and they have to be open from nine to five. Massachusetts has 11 days of early voting during regular business hours. New York recently signed a bill that has only nine days of early voting, but the polls have to stay open from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. And the legislation supported by President Biden only mandates 14 days of early voting, but would require the polls to be open for 10 hours on those days. I mention that because to some extent, it's hard to then say which states are voter suppression states and which states aren't. Georgia has the longest number of days, but New York has the longest number of hours per day, even though it has half the number of days. And so to be able to say that one of those is suppressing the vote and the other one isn't, I think misses some of the nuance in this. Um, you know, if you work a nine to five job, I would think that New York's hours being longer would make up for the fact that there's fewer number of days. But if you're a mom trying to run kids to 50 different activities, having 17 different days to try to fit in voting might be more helpful. Uh, and other, you know, the, the Brennan Center who wrote up this 19 state voter suppression thing said four states eliminated, eliminated or limited sending mail ballot applications to voters who did not request them. But in fact, every state in question, none eliminated sending mail ballot applications to voters who didn't request them. All of them simply said that if an outside group sends unsolicited applications, they have to say somewhere on it that they're not representing the government. This isn't some sort of official government mandate. Um, and so I find that the debate going on misses a lot of the point. And of course, the idea that states made it easier for partisans to overturn elections. Uh, that's actually just two states that they're looking at, Arkansas and Georgia. Both states changed who counts votes, but in Georgia, for instance, they changed it to a nonpartisan appointee by the state legislature, removing the secretary of state from that position who was appointed. And in Alabama, they changed it from the county commissioners to the county something or others uh, that I don't have right in front of me. But the point being, very hard to say that they've made it easier for partisans to manipulate uh, vote counting in the end, um, regardless of the fact that there are so many layers to American elections uh, that are built in for exactly that reason. So I'll leave it at that. And it's all to say that taking some of these debates away from sort of their emotional voter suppression versus stolen elections is kind of my goal. And to actually have a conversation about um, what is actually happening and taking some of the culture war out of it. Thanks so much for that, Sarah. Uh, next, I'll hand it over to Megan. Uh, hi. Um, so I want to say, I want to sort of build on that because I think that's a lot of the sort of the same areas that I was going to talk about. But, you know, look, I would say this is that to me, democratic norms about honoring free and fair elections, about the peaceful transfer of power, this is fundamentally an elite truce. Uh, we like to talk about, you know, this being about the people, but my personal experience of talking to voters is that most of them are pretty weakly attached to democracy. Um, they like it in theory, but if their guy wants to violate democratic norms, they will go along with it. And so what you actually, what actually has to happen is that elites and particularly elites within your own coalition, you have to enforce that on each other. And if you stop enforcing that on each other, you're going to see stuff like what Trump did in January 6th. But let's not forget that Democrats have had a dangerous, without both sides in this, every, what Trump did is worse than anything that the Democrat has done. But that said, look, Democrats have developed a really dangerous habit of claiming that there are procedural differences over how to run elections, these small things like how many days are absentee ballots or you know, how many days is of early voting, 
um, how many ballot boxes there are in a county. It's not that I, I don't think they're necessarily wrong. I don't think they're necessarily wrong about those procedural questions, but they don't just argue like, this is wrong. They argue, this is Jim Crow. This election is fundamentally illegitimate and the person who won didn't win, right? And you saw that most clearly with Stacey Abrams, who is still very popular among the Democratic Party, has not been chastened by anyone, as far as I can tell, of any importance on her own side um, for doing what is a pretty dangerous thing, which is refusing to admit that she lost an election she lost. Um, there's no evidence that even on her kind of case, theory of the case of how she might have won it, there's just no evidence that she could have gotten enough votes to overcome the fairly large gap between her and her opponent in the 2018 Georgia gubernatorial race. And so, you know, Democrats have also begun flirting with this in a way that was not acceptable a generation ago, and we should ask why. So I want to talk a little bit about the kind of structural forces that are, I think, pulling at um, the American uh, democratic system. Now, like, one thing I think, honestly, is just that if anyone has read the, uh, the Isaac Asimov Foundation series, there's a little bit of like, Trump is the mule. So the Foundation series is about this, this thousand year plan to restore civilization after the fall of a galactic empire. Uh, yes, I'm a super nerd, sorry. Um, but anyway, it is, it is actually just thrown, it's, it's totally destroyed by the emergence of this genetic freak who, who doesn't behave according to what the, what the computer, you know, the computational masters predicted. Um, and Trump is a little bit of that, right? He is kind of theoretically an elite. He's a billionaire, he has a television show, but he, he's really outside of the elite system. He doesn't, he completely bypasses all of the gatekeepers and he comes in and then he starts attacking the system from within because he's an actor who is just self-interested and is just not accounted for in kind of the American system of democratic norms and rules. Um, but I think that you have to say that he is as much a symptom as, as the problem. Um, and I wanna talk about what he's a symptom of. So I, the, I like to talk about, because I'm a columnist and I need catchy phrases for everything, the kind of four Ds of American democracy at the moment. Um, and the first is distance. And if you think about what um, America's economy, what America's news environment looked like um, in 1950, you know, Economic and media markets used to be defined by physical limits. How far can a light wave travel with a radio or a television signal? How far can a newspaper delivery truck like go in a day? Um, so each place, the news environment, the, the community, the culture has local elites that are constrained by a local community and they often, they reflect the values of that community. Um, now alleged educational elites are sorting away. It's called the, the big sort where people are moving, we're, we're, segregating by education within neighborhoods, but also within the country where you're having this kind of centrifugal force that is pushing the educated elites to the coast. And then you have the interior, which is losing those people. And so they're farther from uh, a, a great mass of voters, both sort of physically, but also distance, like actually, you know, cultural distance, economic distance. They don't live the same kinds of lives. And also increasingly, unlike my parents' generation, both first generation college students, um, they don't even know anyone who's in the working class, right? You know, the, the educated people in America are, are increasingly a kind of hereditary elite. And that is causing, I think, a lot of big problems as the educated are pulling away from everyone economically. Uh, and as I say, culturally, as well as physically, if you look at the values of the educated, they're increasingly a lot different from the uneducated in a way that wasn't necessarily true um, 50 years ago. Um, and so if you consider the big forecasting failures of recent years, the fact that Trump won the primary and then the, the election, um, the fact that Democrats lost Hispanic voters to the anti-immigration candidate, or the unpopularity of what were supposed to be crowd-pleasing policies like the child tax credit, um, I think this reflects the fact that the people who are making these policies, especially on the Democratic side, I think has this as a worse problem. Republicans have their own pathologies I'm happy to talk about later. Um, but the, the people in the Democratic Party, like their mental model of the working class is terrible. They are really bad at constructing policies that appeal to the working class. And they have in a lot of ways alienated them with their own kind of internal cultural politics, uh, which is where we get the woke wars, right? Um, so the third D is just an intermediation, which is that structurally for a couple of reasons, um, the old gatekeepers have just been destroyed. So one is just social media, right? Trump uses social media to basically bypass all of the old gatekeepers and attack the system from without rather than within as Ronald Reagan did, um, who also like leveraged a fair amount of Hollywood popularity, but was still fundamentally a system guy. He was the governor of California. He was not just a, you know, crowdsourcing a campaign. Um, 
but you also have decades of good government reforms, campaign finance reform, uh, transparency initiatives, the primary elections that destroyed the old power centers. Someone like Trump in 1960 would have had a very hard time taking over the Republican Party for the simple reason that the Republican Party had so many levers to block him. Um, and because there were only three networks, and if the Republican Party leaned on those networks heavily enough, probably those networks would not have aired nearly as much free Trump coverage as, as he got from CNN. Um, and so, you know, you have this disintermediation problem, you have a problem of activism of a representation. If you think about old activists, old groups within parties, say like the labor movement, right, for years, the mainstay of the Democratic Party, those labor leaders represent their membership. Right, they're elected by their membership and they have to, they have to, they're accountable to that lit, lit, uh, membership. Now, if you look at who are the power centers in the Democratic Party, it's activist groups, often funded by foundations who have who are sitting on big piles of money. They're not accountable to anyone, but they purport to speak for those groups. So, like women's groups speaking for women. Well, there's lots of Republican women they don't speak for. Um, but they are treated as if somehow they represent these large identity groups that they don't actually speak for, that no one elected them to do, and that that cannot fire them if the if that group doesn't actually agree with them. And I think that, for example, is is what has led to a lot of missteps on immigration, which just turned out not to matter nearly as much to let Hispanic voters as it did to activists who claim to represent Hispanic voters. Um, and so I, I think the last thing that brings us to is just dysfunction. Um, and I'll sum up by saying, look, elites have lost their direct connections to the normal people in their coalitions. And so instead what you're getting is a lot of weird infighting between elites um, rather than speaking for those voters. And it is therefore not very surprising. And there's the fact that everyone's in their own information universes, right? We have sorted into you are a Fox News viewer or you're a CNN viewer or whatever. And you have your own sets of facts that are just mutually incomprehensible. You cannot get a liberal to believe anything Tucker Carlson has said, even in the, in the instances where he is right. And sometimes he is right and the New York Times is wrong. And vice versa, you cannot get anyone who, who is a, a, um, a Fox viewer to believe the New York Times, even if the New York Times is it 100% correct. Um, and I think that this is, has led to the fact that there is a, a huge, de a precipitous decline in trust. We are unable to communicate with each other. We are unable to trust that the other side is not doing devious things to screw us. And so even though I think it's very obvious that Trump lost the election, um, I am stymied in attempting to communicate that to people who don't read the Washington Post and think that we're basically just a bought and paid for, uh, you know, voice of, of the, uh, the woke elite. And I, I think that I don't know how we get out of this, but if we don't get out of it, we're going to have more trumps from both parties. Thank you, Megan. And I'll turn it over now to Matt. Thank you. Uh, the, the one problem with going last is that I think you're going to see a lot of the same themes in what I'm going to say as what Sarah and, and Megan say. Not that we're all in agreement on everything, certainly, but um, one, I, I think they're spot on. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, thank you, uh, Thomas, for inviting me. I really appreciate being added to this esteemed panel. Um, just briefly, I've been studying elections and developing new policies for how to administer them uh, for most of my career. Um, in my opinion, the election administration process in the United States is more accessible and secure than at any time in our history. Um, but you definitely won't hear that if you, if you ask an average American on the street. Um, I should note that, and this has been mentioned before by maybe Sarah, um, you know, the level of distrust um, in the voting process tends to go up and down among partisans, depending on whether their candidate at the top of the ticket won the last election. For example, Democrats were pretty happy with the process, the voting process, when President Barack Obama was winning in 2008 and in 2012. Republicans, although they tend to be a little bit more skeptical on average, uh, were generally happy with the process in 2016 when President Trump won. Um, the problem now is that the level of distrust is trending underwater for both partisans, um, both Republican partisans and, and Democratic partisans, and it doesn't really matter who the victor is. Um, and this is all happening, of course, at a time when voting policy is as good as it ever was. You know, for example, we have paper ballots, we have auditing processes, we have um, wide windows for voting, we have um, better voter registration options than ever before, and yet still Americans think that our process is not on the up and up. Um, in my brief five minutes, though, I want to focus primarily on two features of American elections that are contributing, in my view, to confusion generally and leave us vulnerable to mis- and disinformation campaigns both from within our borders and from external state actors. Um, first, I think somewhat unique, uh, the American voting process is extremely decentralized. Um, we may vote for candidates for, for national office, but that process happens state by state. Um, our electoral college famously is composed of electors 
sent from the various states. And in fact, states don't actually have to have popular elections for presidential um, electors at all. State legislatures could vote uh, themselves to send electors to electoral college. Um, there are only a few national election laws that we have in this country, and most are passed in the last three decades. Uh, these cover minimum standards for voter registration, military and overseas voting, and provisional ballots. Almost all other rules American voters experience on election day are set by state law. For example, federal election days are set by federal law, but options like mail-in voting, early voting, polling place availability, whether election day is a holiday in a state, these are all state level decisions. Um, this format has worked for most of our history, especially when communication was slower and fewer news cycles were nationalized. Uh, but now voters in one state can clearly see what's happening in another state and compare it to their options. For example, some states require voter ID to cast a ballot, some have in-person voting windows for 15 days, which again has been mentioned before. Um, moreover, states have different terms for the exact same process. You know, what, what's called voting by mail in one state could be absentee voting in another or advanced voting in still another. These varying policies and varying terms further contribute to misunderstandings about the voting process and that contributes to uh, distrust in the system itself. Um, another problem with the extreme decentralization in our American election process is how local jurisdictions resource the voting process. Bigger jurisdictions, usually the cities, um, have more resources and can provide more accessible voting options to their voters. Uh, these resources vary dramatically within states, again, fueling distrust even among uh, residents of the same state. Um, for the most part, um, it should be noted that states do not reimburse local jurisdictions for all of their election costs, meaning that election departments at the super local level need to compete with schools, police, fire, and other local departments for very limited funding. Um, in this system, in this structure, um, long-term capital costs like improving voting machine um, availability or having more polling places um, are almost impossible to budget for. And this is further enhancing the divide between generally rural voters and, and urban voters. And we have a, a pretty stark political divide between urban and rural voters. And I know I'm running short on time and I think this is gonna be a great conversation, but there's just a few more things I wanna make sure I, I make clear. Um, I want to throw some data uh, about the decentralization of American voting at you. Uh, we have 50 voting states, obviously. We have the District of Columbia that are voting on federal election days. However, there are 3,000 counties in the, in the United States and 8,000 individual reporting jurisdictions. Uh, the state of Wisconsin has about 6 million um, individuals and 1,851 reporting jurisdictions. It's a super local state. Um, some of their, their reporting jurisdictions, the level that actually has to finance their own voting equipment are as small as 200 voters. You know, contrast that with New Jersey, which has 9 million residents and only 21 reporting jurisdictions. Um, some of our states are very top down. Maryland and Georgia buy the voting equipment um, at the state level and, and every jurisdiction uses the same voting equipment. Um, most other states though, allow their local jurisdictions and they then can range from 200 voters to 4 million voters uh, to purchase their own equipment. Um, that's usually somehow pre-certified by the state. Um, this is again leading to cases where even within the same state, voters are looking at what their neighbors can do or, or the options their, their neighbors have um, and misunderstanding why their process is different. Um, aside from being decentralized, another contributing factor in the rise of distrust is also just how the voting process itself has become part of the campaigns. Um, you know, it's not new that partisan candidates are working the refs or the election officials. That's been happening for decades. But the parties today, and again, we've heard this before, have conditioned their supporters to view almost everything in elections through either red tinted or blue tinted glasses. Republicans are claiming huge amounts of voter fraud in the system. And when they can't find good examples, they use just a perception of voter fraud um, or a policy they think could lead to voter fraud as an excuse to attack the process. And usually after election day, claim that's the reason why they may have lost. Democrats have been conditioned um, to see every change in the voting process as process as indicative of voter suppression. You know, if a polling place has moved down the road, uh, is that voting suppression, voter suppression or is that redistricting that, has, that happens on a, a fairly regular schedule in this country? If an early voting window is shrunk from 20 days to 15 days or even smaller, is that voter suppression or is that because you know, in many cases we have states that have huge early voting windows where very few people are, are using that option for all the 20 days um, and, and the resources could be better reallocated um, to other options. So the problem, of course, is that Democrats now view all of those changes as voter suppression when obviously the case is more nuanced. Uh, I believe there are multiple other contributing factors, but I'll stop here and I, I look forward to this great discussion.
Great, thank you, Matt. And thanks to all of our panelists for a really thought-provoking set of points. You know, it's interesting actually, I think, to, to know how much consensus there is on, on um, some of these ideas surrounding the integrity of American elections. Um, just a reminder, if uh, our audience could start putting questions into the chat function, uh, we'll get to those very uh, quickly. Please do that. Um, in the meantime, I guess I just wanted to kind of start this conversation off with a thought experiment, and that is, what if Republicans or what if Trump specifically wins in 2024? Um, I don't think that anyone would deny that Trump took the notion of rejecting the validity of a duly elected president and supercharged it uh, in 2020. But as was already noted, um, we have seen some Democrats flirting with similar ideas. Stacey Abrams um, in Georgia, even Hillary Clinton following the 2016 election equivocated when she was asked if uh, Trump was a, a legitimate president. Um, and so I guess I'd just be curious, um, anyone on our panel who would like to kind of respond to that, um, how that may unfold, will we see Democrats um, challenge that election result? I mean, I think in some sense we already did, right? The, the Russia hysteria um, without, again, defending Donald Trump's absurd and really not like noxious um, flirting with telling Russia, you know, I hope you release the emails and all that, um, that the left went insane on a theory that went way beyond Donald Trump openly invited a foreign power um, to help influence our elections. He, he, the, the, we all were expecting, or I, I wasn't, but a lot of people were expecting, that we were gonna get documents that showed that he was basically a Manchurian candidate, puppet of Russia, of Russia. And the theories of how this had been accomplished, aside from releasing the emails, were like $300,000 worth of Facebook ads had somehow swung the election, right? The whole Russian disinformation obsession, which I think is actually, frankly, playing into how the left is treating Russia's invasion of Ukraine right now. Uh, I'm on the side of the Ukrainians here, but I, I do think that it is striking to see people who 10 years ago would have been ex extremely concerned about uh, Russia, you know, American involvement abroad and also who were friendlier to Russia than they often were to US policy, um, how that has, has changed uh, because of the, the Russian disinformation. I, I really worry about this because I think there is a real chance that Donald Trump, I think it's actually, probably more likely than not that Donald Trump is the nominee for the Republicans in 2024, unfortunately. Um, and I think there's a good chance that he just wins. And I don't even mean that there, I, I think there's a chance, not just that he wins, but not some lame electoral college victory. I think there's a chance that he just wins more states than Democrats. And I think that there are a lot of Democrats who are not going to take that. They are not going to accept that that is a legitimate result of a democratic system. Now, how they attack that legitimacy will be different from how Trump would, right? I, I would expect, for example, to hear that it is illegitimate because it's racist, because people, the people who voted for him are racist and therefore somehow their votes don't count really in the same way that non-racist votes do and that therefore he shouldn't be president. But to fundamentally treat him, not just as a guy I really hate, who lost, who won, but as somehow not actually representing the legitimate outcome of a democratic system. I think that this is bipartisan. And again, without well, completely acknowledging that Trump went farther um, in, in a much more dangerous fashion than Democrats have, I still think that we have a crisis of legitimacy on both sides, not just among the Republican Party. Sarah, do I you just jump in? Or, or Matt? I just jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with most of that. I think what I'll say is it depends on how close it is, right? Um, and it depends on what happens in certain states. Um, you know, we, we have seen over the past year, some states um, dabbling in what I would consider to be very dangerous um, legislation, you know, inserting the legislature into the certification process, giving the legislature some short, sort of check. Well, you know, if the for example, Arizona and Wisconsin are considering these, these kind of bills right now, which would allow somehow the legislature to overturn a, a popular um, vote and, and send the electoral college votes of, of, a, of a losing candidate to Washington. Now, now that to me would be a, a hugely illegitimate outcome. Yeah. It would be using legitimate power to do it, right? The, the legislatures have legitimate power to do some of these things, and that's kind of scary. So if that if that's the case, you know, if they, in Arizona or and Wisconsin was won by you know a Democratic candidate, and yet the Republican votes will go to, go to Trump. That would be a, a problem. And one other thing that I'm gonna I'm gonna let someone else get in there is our electoral college. You know, while I, I support it, I understand why we have it. 
understand why it's very difficult to change it, probably not going to be changing. I, I think most people who are experts on the Torah College, and I am not one of them, would say it was hard to imagine 10, 15 years ago, you know, kind of after Bush v. Gore, that you could have a huge difference um, in the popular vote and the Electoral College vote. Maybe you could have like a million more um, popular vote and then still lose the Electoral College. I think we are trending towards a, a time when we could have, you know, one candidate winning 10 million more popular votes and yet the other candidate winning the Electoral College. And that is going to be a problem that we need to figure out. And I, I don't know how we figure that out, honestly. I want to agree on on both points. I mean, first of all, I think that an electoral college victory that is consistently 10 million off in the wrong direction is a problem that American democracy will have to address. Um, and I also think that while I agree, it is constitutional for the legislature just to pass laws saying like we get to decide who wins. Um, I don't think that that I think that that would be a constitutional crisis. It would create a huge democratic like deficit of democratic legitimacy, um, especially if it involves sort of overruling the, the election conducted by rules set up by the legislature, right? Um, and so I, I am not arguing, I am arguing that a, a scenario that worries me is that even if none of that happens, I, I'm, it's not, and even if it's a pretty big victory, right? Like maybe it's not very likely that Trump wins by 52, 53%, but I can picture that happening and Democrats just somehow coming up with reasons that he's not really the president. There was voter suppression, there was this, there was that. Um, and and no, he's not really president. There was Russian, you know, and it was Russia and Ukraine, whatever it is, that somehow they will not accept that he's actually president and has the right to do presidential things. Three quick points. Uh, one, uh, I am clearly the outlier in that I think that a uh, state legislature could, as you say, set up a different manner for creating their electoral college slate in advance of an election. But I actually do think that it would be unconstitutional um, to change the manner of picking the electoral college slate after an election and you know the results. This is being debated right now. This isn't that I'm right and they're wrong or anything like that. Um, when Congress right now is looking at drafts for how to uh, redo the Electoral Count Act, it's one of the top things that they are going to include in that is clarifying that you can't change the manner of the election after you know the results um, in state legislature. So that's at least debatable. I don't think it's um, obvious that even if those bills pass, they could have the intended effect. Uh, second, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the misinformation, disinformation problem. And Megan, to your point, I think one of the things that will be argued is, um, again, let's assume this is a Donald Trump winning scenario, although I don't think it's limited to that. Donald Trump wins by a substantial percentage, but it's illegitimate because he was using disinformation and misinformation, uh, committing a fraud on the American people. And that's why it's illegitimate. And so you see efforts to address that that make me deeply uncomfortable. Not that I'm for disinformation or misinformation in our elections, but rather our history is filled with misinformation and disinformation, right? Like Abraham Lincoln, um, you know, was a misogynist who had a black mistress and, you know, that has gone on in our elections for a long time. It doesn't make it, obviously it doesn't make it right, but it doesn't make it good either or um, neutral that it's somehow okay that that happens. But the remedies to fixing it are deeply, deeply concerning because at the point that the government starts labeling things as misinformation or disinformation, or in a modern case, putting pressure on social media companies, for instance, to take down uh, information, the government, mind you, not Twitter deciding to take down something, but the government putting pressure on Twitter to do so, uh, you end up with a little bit of, you know, I think the best example right now is the COVID problem where, um, it was labeled as misinformation, the idea that COVID could have originated even accidentally in a lab. A year later, it's like, well, that's not misinformation or disinformation. And for a year, basically, no one was allowed to talk about that on social media without being taken off. Again, I think that's Twitter's right, Facebook's right to do so. But when we're talking about election remedies, you're talking about the government stepping in and saying which speech is allowed. I want to stop deep fake videos as much as anyone. I think they are corrosive to our politics, but we've survived this long with equivalent flyers and pamphlets saying outrageously, just hilariously incorrect things about candidates. Um, and at the point that the government starts saying what is and isn't allowed, 
beware the consequences of, of that. Uh, Matt, one question that I did want to ask you, you talked a lot about how, um, you know, state laws surrounding elections just vary considerably. Um, you know, what, if you're a, a citizen, then, you know, it makes it very easy for you to kind of latch on to your convenient case and say, you know, this proves that, you know, an election here or there um, was, was not legitimate. And precisely because there's just so much information that you can't possibly know um, what election rules look like in each of these places, it, it allows, you know, partisan media to kind of cherry pick, I think, examples and spin them into their own narrative. I mean, is there any remedy for that? I mean, does that, is that an argument for more centralization of elections? Is this just something that we have to deal with as an artifact of the US political system? How would you respond to that? Yeah, largely, I, I do believe it's an artifact that we're, we're stuck with generally. And that's not necessarily bad. I mean, again, a decentralized process has some benefits. Maybe I didn't talk about them in my opening, right? I mean, one, it's harder to, to hack an election when you have to hack 8,000 jurisdictions, right? I mean, if a problem happens with one machine, there's a benefit to not having that machine throughout the entire state, right? So there, there are benefits to the decentralization. You know, Congress has has debated, um, you know, and, and Democrats have certainly promoted, you know, HR one, S one, Freedom to Vote Act, that would provide, um, you know, very very strong standards for what every state had to do. I, I believe the federal government has the ability to do that when it comes to federal elections. You know, the Constitution clearly reserves that right to Congress if they want to legislate on that. Um, but that would be a pretty big change for, for how we've done our elections uh, in this country. So it's hard to imagine them doing it. They didn't have 50 votes to do it. They didn't have anywhere close to 60 votes to do it uh, this year. So certainly not happening soon, but um, I do think that's that's one issue. Um, when, when I talk about decentralization, decentralization in states, um, just a, a specific example for how this contributes to misinformation. You know, I, before the 2020 election, was very big on transparency. Maybe transparency was one way to um, you know, make sure that people understood the process. It was on the up and up. But transparency, when you have a decentralized process, is actually really, really hard to do. And, and the example there is, is Georgia. Georgia did some great things, making sure that everything they were doing on vote counting was live streamed, for example. But the problem is most Americans, pretty much all Americans, have no idea what they're looking at when they're looking at a, a vote counting process. And, and having videos of what some were able to twist into you know, big problems um, actually contributed to more distrust. So while transparency is a, is a big thing and we want to make sure we, um, we are doing that um, in light of a decentralized process, you know, no gatekeepers, um, as Sarah said earlier, um, and, and it's social media that anyone can access, everyone's the, their own publisher, um, is something we have to consider how to, how to do this. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? I mean, what's the responsibility, I guess, of the media here in particular? Um, I know we have some opinion columnists on the panel. <laughs> um, I think that we have a problem. Um, and I, I think it is summed up by uh, something that happened when I would say in 2016, like Trump is, I don't know if Trump's a racist, I can't peer into his heart. He's certainly willing to pander to racists and that's a problem. Um, and my conservative commenters, who were pretty mad at me by that point, um, would rejoinder, well, the media said that George Bush was a racist too. And I was like, but I didn't say that, but it didn't matter. We used the word, right? Like we, we burned the word racist on Mitt Romney and George Bush, and it had no power by the time we actually had Donald Trump to contend with. And I think that there has a, just a history of like, look, my profession leans very left. Um, it has leaned more left over the years. Um, it is under pressure from a rising generation of, of young journalists who, first of all, just kind of don't believe in the old proceduralism. Um, they think it's it's empty and that it empowers the worst sort of, you know, like racist and sexist and so forth. And so they want us to push for moral, moral clarity instead. And I think the problem with that is that like, it's kind of pointless. It's like the, the stuff that we're willing to be morally clear on, our readers already agree with, with us on, and it alienates everyone who doesn't agree with us. And so we end up being more and more clear and less and less understood. Um, and I think that this is a just historic problem with the media and with communicating all of these ideas to people is that we're just living in two different information universes now. And people like Sarah are, and I, to some extent, like we're trying to, we're, 
we're in positions where we're trying to bridge that gap, but we're, I'm, we're also never Trump. And, you know, I burned that bridge when I said, I will literally vote for anyone who is not Donald Trump, preferably a land-based mammal, not that picky, right? Um, and I don't know how to get back from that. I tried not to do a lot of the over the top stuff that a lot of never Trump people did where you attack the voters. I've always consistently, I attack Trump. I don't attack his voters. I think they're mistaken, but I think lots of people are mistaken about lots of stuff. I don't need them all to be unreconstructed racists and like the, the evil bane of humanity to say that I think they made a mistake and that they shouldn't have supported him. Um, but that dynamic is really hard to maintain, but it's especially hard to maintain within these organizations that are pushing harder and harder to the left for kind of structural social reasons. And which have found for whatever reason, it very difficult to check that push from, from the younger staffers who just don't believe in it and don't see why we should attempt to reach out to Trump voters because they're bad. So why would you try to talk to bad people? Um, and I think that's a real issue. I would also pull in what Matthew was saying about the great sort. Um, I would not thought about it in the context of the electoral college, but I think it's such a smart point. I've defended the electoral college forever. And, you know, this was the compromise our whole country was based on. You don't get the constitution without the electoral college. And all of that is still true. But at some point, <laughs> for the first time, we're having uh, not the regional interests drive the vote, but in fact, the voters literally drive to a different region um, and sort themselves. And it, it's most apparent to me in the amendment process, our constitution wasn't meant to just be uh, the articles as they were. And over time, as we get further from the initial drafting of the constitution, what you would expect sort of behind the veil is the pace of amendments to pick up. But in fact, we've seen the opposite. Why? There's a few reasons, but one of the reasons is actually the great sort that Matthew's pointing out, which is that, um, you have to have 38 states, basically, to pass an amendment. And the 12 least populous states have under 4% of the US population right now. And they can stop any amendment, which means 96% of us roughly have to agree to amend the Constitution. Uh, and so what happens? The Supreme Court's deciding a lot of constitutional issues that actually are just should be up to people to actually amend the Constitution. But the Supreme Court's having to read it into it because there is no amendment process. Congress isn't doing anything. And why isn't Congress doing anything? Because we've totally changed the incentives so that there's no need for Congress to do anything to get reelected. In fact, doing something would hurt their reelection chances. And I have a whole album side on how campaign finance reform has led to that. Uh, but as Megan and Matthew were saying, the, the weakening of the parties, which again, I would argue happened in 2002, uh, most dramatically with uh, the McCain-Feingold Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, parties had all of this power uh, and it was largely based on money, frankly. And we said, uh, parties will no longer have any money, any more money really than the candidates in terms of what they can raise. Well, then why would anyone give money to a political party? And if you're giving it only to the individual candidates, party membership matters less, which we've also seen. And so then it's like, well, how are you going to get donors attention? And in the era of this new technology with social media, small dollar donors are now driving the vast majority of campaign dollars. And how you're getting their attention, this 2% of um, the American electorate are the only people who give any money, 20 bucks to candidates. They're not representative of everyone else. And they respond most to outrage, anger, whose fault is it? Twitter mobs, Facebook mobs. And this is universal. This isn't even one side does it worse or better than the other. This is just all of it. They're identical uh, in most respects in terms of those campaign dollars with one exception. Currently on the right, 22 cents on every dollar being raised is going to Donald Trump. And he is such a dominant force for fundraising on the right. It has distorted like a a gravitational pull on the blanket of, you know, um, of mass in the universe that is all getting pulled into Trump on the right. We have not seen that happen on the left, but as Megan pointed out, you see it happen with individual interest groups on the left uh, that don't represent anything except for large donors. Well, um, and you also so see these really stupid campaigns, like all this money that ends up getting poured into trying to defeat Ted Cruz, although Beto came reasonably close. 
um, or Mitch McConnell, who is in like the reddest red state in the country and is not going to just not going to elect a Democrat. And millions, tens of millions of dollars go into those races instead of races where the Democrats could win. Absolutely. Right. And then at the end, when they lose, these people are shocked, stunned, and disheartened in the political system. And all that it's benefited are campaign consultants. I also, I've been very frustrated with the turn Texas blue. I'm from Texas. It's a state that I've worked in politically. And I've tried to explain to people, it's in nobody's interest to tell you that Texas isn't going to turn blue. And yet there is no evidence to support this idea. And in fact, any evidence that existed that Texas was trending a little bit more to the Democrats has actually been reversed in the last five years. And yet money just keeps pouring in because it's in every consultant's interest, every candidate's interest on both sides. It's on a Democrat candidate's interest to say, give me money, obviously. But if you're wondering why Republicans aren't pushing back that hard against the turn Texas blue thing, it's because, look, I'm being uh, challenged by an incredibly well-funded opponent. Give me more money and around and around it goes. And the incentives are just not with voters. And it's so frustrating to watch as an operative and someone who knows this world really well, um, you know, to see people throw away their 20 bucks, their 40 bucks. And it's really tempting to say it would be better if we did more campaign finance reforms. No, or, no, I agree. But like a lot of people on the left are immediately like what we need is, but the problem is that that then just creates other weird imbalances, like the obsession with Trump, right? Like they gave him a billion dollars worth of earned media, which is way more valuable than campaign ads or anything you can buy with money, right? And that was because we loved telling ourselves that the, the Republicans were just a bunch of horrible trolls and look at the horrible troll, look at the show, look at the troll like pounding his chest and waving his arms, right? Like that, the, the, taking the money out doesn't solve the problem. It just moves the problem to a different kind of center of power. As someone who ran Carly Fiorina's campaign, I can just like, <laughs> I have no words for how I feel about the 2015 media circus that was, it's no big deal to cover Trump this much. It's funny. It's entertaining. There's no harm. Yeah. Or all the Democrats who were like, I mean, you know, Matt Iglesias, Jonathan Jay, there were a bunch of them who were like, actually, I think Trump's the best candidate. He'd be better <laughs> than any of these, right? Like, and then as soon as he was nominated, they were like, and then when he won, they're like, okay, well, that was a mistake, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, they thought he'd be easy to beat. So it was fun exactly. to focus on him. And the point where he won, it was not so funny. Well, and in Missouri, that worked. Claire McCaskill picked Todd Aiken. She ran millions of dollars for Todd Aiken to be able to run against the candidate she thought was most defeatable. And I said at the time, I thought that was a disgusting, um, incredibly cynical choice because what if she was wrong, right? She spent millions of dollars with the hope that Todd Aiken would say legitimate rape, he did, she proved right. But that exact same thinking, of course, then elected Donald Trump president because he was gonna be so easy for Hillary to beat. Um, and so it's a dangerous thing to play games with American politics and to have this cynical, I know better, five dimensional chess idea. It's, it's just, it's dangerous and wrong. Money finds a way, money's like water, man. Do no limits, full disclosure, 11 states already do it. Texas, Pennsylvania, Virginia. It's not, you know, they're not some super corrupt problem in any of those states with their state elections. Um, and at least, at least then in my view, we'd have a chance of digging out of this super pack hole. I mean, there's so much stupid stuff going on on the money side. So I would like to suggest my pet campaign finance reform, which Ooh. is my limits, but um, I'm sure this is stupid. I'm a columnist, not a professional, but like no limits, but it has to, you can donate any amount of money to any candidate or any party, but it has to go into a blind trust and it gets dispersed quarterly. So you can't, you can't see who donated to your campaign. So there's, you can sever that like anyone can donate any amount of money, but there is no, like no one ever knows who donated to them. You can claim that you did, but since it's only dispersed quarterly, there's no way to kind of track the funds to the donor. Megan, it's kind of genius. Mine well, was just immediate disclosure that you'd have to disclose then 24 hours, anyone who donated, but yeah, like why tell the candidates at all? And you're right. Then people can just lie sort of like, have you ever gotten one of those texts from your friends? That's like a group text where they're like, someone just sent me a dozen cupcakes. Which one of you did it? And everyone's like me. <laughs> yeah, I definitely did it. I sent you those cupcakes. I absolutely remembered it was your birthday for sure. <laughs> Oh, it's a fascinating proposal, Megan. Um, before I open it up uh, to the audience, I just want to ask one other question because this is something that I think both Sarah and Megan have mentioned in their comments, and that is 
um, you know, Joe Biden using the kind of Jim Crow 2.0 language and his speech where he said you're either with me or you're with Bull Connor or, and Jefferson Davis. Uh, this is a self-styled moderate using language like this. Um, what is the incentive structure that is leading someone like Joe Biden to adopt that kind of, you know, what, what could be construed as very inflammatory language? I mean, is this something that he just believes? I, I guess I hadn't seen him use rhetoric like that before. Is this just pandering to the left? You know, does he think he's getting something politically out of it? I, I'd be curious to kind of know the, the, the responses. And if someone like that's making comments, you know, what, what hope do we have, I guess? I pandering to John that. Meacham, who wrote it. Okay. I, I really, I actually think this might be really simple that Joe Biden really respects John Meacham and Meacham yeah. told him like, here's a speech, this is what you should say. And he was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the, the broad problem is that, you know, like if you talk to people in democratic politics versus people in Republican politics, I'm not saying anything that professionals have not heard before, but like, it's fairly clear, right? It, the democratic problem is that the donors and staffers are crazy and the voters are basically sane, whereas the Republican Party <laughs> problem is that the voters are insane, but the staffers and the, and the profession and the donors are basically sane. And I think that's a real, that's actually a real truth is that the, the donors and the staffers, the, the Democratic Party are really, really, really far to the left. And they're really, really, really obsessed with this kind of performative, um, identity politics. That is the most important thing. If you are battling for supremacy within that small elite coalition, what really matters is that you perform the most strongly on calling everything out as problematic and so forth. And the problem is that that really doesn't resonate with voters at all. Um, and that, and again, because those groups don't have, they don't represent and they are not accountable to the groups that they're purporting to speak for. Um, this kind of goes unchecked because all the activists kind of nod along and because it makes them more powerful, right? Is if, if, if maximal anti-sexism, maximal um, anti-everything is the, the key, is the most important way to win votes, then they are more important and they have more power within the coalition. And so I think what happens is that these staffers are performing for each other instead of performing for voters. And I think it's incredibly dangerous and this for the same some of the same reasons that that what Trump did was incredibly dangerous, although again pausing to note that it was worse. Um, <laughs> which is that it undercuts the legitimacy of the system that you are relying on to give you results, if you want to use the system to get stuff done people have to believe that the system's legitimate. And if you say things if you if you cannot draw a distinction between you know, good or bad, the voting changes around things like early voting in Georgia, if you cannot draw a distinction between that and Jim Crow, then A, you don't sound serious to anyone who is not within this little game of in-group signaling. Um, but B, you're even within, for your own voters, you're telling them the system's not legitimate. You're telling them not to honor its results. It's just bad all around and it, it really needs to stop. And that's not, again, defending what Republicans are doing, certainly with the stuff where they're making it easier for le legislatures to override elections. That's worse than any of this. It's toxic, it needs to stop. I, I call it out, I call it out robustly. Um, but you also have to be able to call out stuff on the other side. You can't just say, well, we'll, we'll get around to talking about that when we fixed Republicans, because that's not how it works. This This dynamic is, is, is a kind of back and forth where, where the extremities of one side license extremity on the other. Okay. Right. I think we'll open it up now to the Q&A from the audience. So please do uh, put your questions into the chat feature and we'll get to as many as possible. So the first one comes from Daniel and uh, he asks, how do we navigate conversations where feelings about elect the election overwhelm the experts. For example, Attorney General Barr said that there was no fraud in 2020 and he lost relevancy. Um, who, do the, who then do we trust and how do we back up our arguments? Let me kick that one over to, to Matt to start with. I don't know. Um, I don't know who to trust at this point. I mean, there, there was a pretty big campaign in uh, 2020 by the secretaries of state in the various states to to be the trusted info. The problem is the, the way our country is set up, in most states, the Secretary of State themselves is the chief election official in the state. So we have partisan officials, um, sometimes who are on the ballots, running the elections. Um, something that's actually gonna be more extreme in 2022 than it was in 2020. Um, and and that, that's becoming its own problem. 
typically I, I, I point people towards their local election officials, but for the most part, people don't know who those people are. Um, and and that's that's a real big problem that we're having. I, I don't have a great answer to this, but Megan, Sarah, what do you think? What do you think? I thought the bar thing was the perfect encapsulation of the rot and the rot around Trump, really, that um, everyone around Trump is trusted until they say something the base doesn't like. And then they're no longer trusted, which proves that it has nothing to do with that person or their credibility. Um, and by the way, to me at least, it shows the limitations of Trump himself. It is not that Trump created these voters, it's that these voters created Trump. Uh, and Trump's, I think, both aware of it and not happy about that, right? That, um, you know, when he said he was supporting vaccines and boosters and he got booed by his own people, like his endorsements don't seem to carry actually much weight. His negative endorsements do. Him attacking someone carries weight, but that's again, that actually shores up that it's, um, it's a specific group of people in the country that I think are... When we look back 50 years from now, when historians talk about this period of American politics, I think it will be seen largely through the lens of the 2008 financial crisis, that that was a crisis um, that affected a lot more Americans than the elites thought because they weren't particularly affected, that it affected men substantially more than women, uh, whereas COVID affected women a lot more in terms of the, the workplace uh, and earning potential. Um, and that Donald Trump was a direct result of all of that. And then as Megan said, like the rot in the Republican parties led to the rot in the Democratic Party, and they're on this treadmill together, you know, red queen um, one upping each other. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't think this is about any one person having the credibility to tell voters how it is. If Bill Barr doesn't have the credibility with Trump voters to say that there wasn't fraud in the election, then no one did, including, by the way, Donald Trump probably. Um, that after people are fed this idea that someone is against them that nobody then had the ability to say like, just kidding, it's fine. Um, and I think unless and until that 2008 wound is fixed or replaced by something else, um, you know, what's going on in Ukraine as odd as this may sound, may be the next big global event that replaces the 2008 financial crisis uh, in terms of changing American and also other countries' politics. And by the way, the reason that I pointed to the 2008 financial crisis, because you've seen the rise of populism in a lot of countries and not just the United States. So if you want to talk about what caused Donald Trump, you're going to have to explain why whatever caused him happened in other countries at the same time. So it can't be a purely American phenomenon. Uh, and so we're going to need to look for another phenomenon to replace this, I think. It's not about as Megan's put, it's not about trust in media. It's not about trust in individual people who are deemed so. It's a far more pervasive and scary problem than that when you're in a self-governing um, country. I think that's right. Although I will also say that Trump was a kind of uniquely bad figure to have in that position. So like I watched this with masks, right? I watched my pro-Trump or at least anti-anti-Trump like readers who were really mad for about a month at the beginning of the pandemic because the CDC had said, don't wear masks. And they were like, obviously mask work, whatever. And then Trump didn't want to wear a mask because he thought it made him look unmanly. Um, and then they had to defend that because the, real, the really important thing was that the libs must suffer and the libs must be wrong, right? And there's quite a bit of that on the left too. So don't pat yourself on the back. Any of my readers who are looking at my, my, the people watching who are like, well, at least I'm not like that. I, there's plenty of that on both sides. But it was that, that, you know, because of that, they had to justify it. And the only way to justify it was to argue that masks don't work. And so suddenly people who a month before had been outraged at the CDC were making the CDC's arguments, even as the CDC was changing its mind. And this is like, and Trump, another president wouldn't have done that, right? Another populist president would not necessarily have done that. Another populist president would not necessarily have claimed he lost an election, he won an election, he lost, right? Like, so well, I think that- but we had some bad luck there. <laughs> Trump does not control these people, right? The booing is the perfect example. When he wants, now he, he, he has unleashed forces that even he cannot fully master. But he also, I think, like there are other populist scenarios like a Boris Johnson 
who just would have been like, might've had a bad party that he shouldn't have had, but would also have been like fundamentally much more responsible than Trump. And I know British viewers are perhaps like bridling a little bit, but, this, but like better than Trump. Just saying. But this goes to exactly the point. It's not that they're following Trump. It's that every time Trump gives them someone who he says, these people look down on you, they're more than willing to then attack those people and own the libs, make the libs cry thing. But it's not Trump. It's not that they're pro him. It's that he points out who their enemies are. And well, they're and willing to do also that. upsets their enemies. The thing that they love more than anything is that he sends progressives into an absolute sputtering rage. And I think that like one of the big mistakes that my profession, among others, made during the four years of the Trump presidency was that we thought that the cure to Trump was more sputtering rage. And all that was doing was giving his followers exactly what they wanted. The more we sputter, the more outrage, right? Like it didn't, I don't think it did anything to save democracy, I'm afraid. I think that all of the kind of congratulatory stuff that actually what it did was make his, it, it gave Trump and all of his followers exactly what they were looking for from the Trump presidency, which was the sight of us in a towering like tizzy. The Jim Acostification of the media. <laughs> Not naming names, but. I, I'm, I'm respecting. Sarah, Sarah's that. naming names, clearly. Um, okay, um, an another question here is on voter ID. And um, it's basically, is the divide between Democrats and Republicans really rooted in legitimate philosophical differences? Or is this just a matter of political convenience as to which side? Um, Democrats happen to be on and Republicans happen to be on. I'm seeing some nodding of heads. Um, Republicans believe that fewer people voting helps them, despite all the evidence that says that that's not true. And Democrats believe that more non-white people voting helps them, despite the fact that that is not nearly as true as they think it is, as they learned in Texas most recently. Um, and that's obviously not a voter ID example, but you're seeing, for instance, Democrats no longer attack voter ID. You'll notice in the bills put forth by Biden that banning voter ID is not in those anymore. Why? Uh, because it turns out their voters are for voter ID now, and especially some of those non-white voters that they thought um, they had sort of a lock with. So yeah, no, there's no question to me that um, you look at the 2005 Carter Baker Commission report that was supposed to be released um, after 2001 to talk about how to make our elections both more secure and more fair. Jimmy Carter, Democratic president, James Baker, Republican secretary of state, uh, 88 recommendations, I believe. And it's like, it's like you're transported to a different country that makes sense. We should just do all 88. No ballot harvesting voter ID, but also some early voting and election day should be a national holiday. And like when you take it out of the partisan who slightly benefits by whichever rule, you're like, oh yeah, this is just really easy. Secure elections with as many people voting as possible or making it as easy for as many people to vote as possible where a three hour line to vote is obviously stupid and not okay. And so that in the Carter Baker thing would trigger, you would get more resources basically. If you have a line that year, then next year we're gonna send you twice as many machines or whatever else without nationalizing elections because that's part of what makes our elections secure. There, it's just so obvious stuff. If you don't pay attention to the partisan where they're trying so hard to come up with reasons why one thing is bad or one thing is good and it contradicts another thing they're for or against, the only through line is that they believe often again, incorrectly without data that it's helping them politically. Yeah, I think that the voter ID issue is bizarre on a number of levels. First of all, I remember like when I was working for The Economist explaining that you could vote without ID and people were like, wow, that's terrible. And I was like, no, no, no. The progressive position is like, you should be able to vote without ID, right? Um, I had similar conversations about the bankruptcy laws. Um, but, but, you know, we're like, wait, you can just walk in and be like, I don't know my money anymore. And the, the court's like, okay, bye. Right. So, you know, Michael this, Scott, I declare bankruptcy. <laughs> so the, the issue is right. Like voter ID is not hard to get. And it's so not hard to get that, that people suing on these cases had a continual problem of like they the people would discover they needed ID for something else. They just go get it and moot the case. Um, right. So, you know, it's not that difficult to get. It doesn't meaning it doesn't appear that these laws have anything to do with how many people turn out. 
Um, and at the same time, voter fraud is incredibly hard to commit in these days of computer uh, computers. If you were going to commit voter fraud, you wouldn't do it this way anyway. Like it's really inefficient um, to send people to multiple polls. Um, and and so like the whole issue, it's just a way for politicians to whip up their bases. There is no evidence that any of this makes the slightest difference either way to either way. getting people to vote or to preventing fraud. It just yeah. it's totally irrelevant. And the whole argument is just from people who like to have something to argue about. Okay, um, another question from Julie wants to ask Matt a question. And that is, as someone who's thought about um, election reform for a long time, what's sort of one change that you would like to see that you think would either increase electoral integrity or increase trust in the election process itself? Well, there's no silver bullet, certainly. Um, so it, it's hard. I, I do think we need as a country to have a conversation about the level of funding that's available for running elections in this country. Um, you know, I mentioned it at the, at the top, the, the resources that different jurisdictions have um, varies very widely. Um, and I do think that's problematic. If, if we do expect some sort of baseline level of, of voting in this country, as Carter Baker was, having some, some options to vote before election day, having voter ID, um, the kind of election security that we, we need, especially in a kind of a cybersecurity stance, these things all cost resources, but in the grand scheme of our American kind of budget, don't cost that much, and yet we're not we're not spending it. Um, so that's one area that I think a lot of the limitations we have um, all the way down to the local level with expanding access and making things more secure could be solved with a relatively minor level of consistent federal funding, or at least state if, if federal funding isn't viable, then states have to step up and, and provide some funding. This is this is literally the bedrock of democracy for us. If we have elections that are failing, um, many reasons why it's happening is not because of intentional sabotage. It's because literally the people who are running elections don't have the resources to do it well. And that's that's really what's contributing in many cases to the, the confidence issues. Uh, Megan, Sarah, anything to add to that? Or any uh, solutions of your own? I, I wish I had a silver bullet. I just think it's really hard and in part because I think like, um, I think people just don't trust their fellow Americans in the way that they used to. Like you, people basically used to assume that, okay, maybe there's some, there were always the jokes about election fraud in Chicago, which probably weren't all wrong. Um, but in general, they assumed that at the county level, most people were doing their best to, to have a, a fair election. And I think that's no longer the assumption. Um, and I, I just think more fundamentally that Americans it's not just about elections, right? Americans just fundamentally think that people who aren't like them are malevolent and are just intent on doing bad things and they don't care about things being good. And all they care about is things being bad and hate, hate, hate. And they look down on you or they're like trying to hurt you or like whatever it is. And fundamentally, I, I think this is a false picture of how other people are. Um, I think it may well be true of a tiny handful of people who are online and make a lot of trouble. Um, <laughs> myself included, I guess. Uh, but but that in fact, most Americans are pretty nice people who will who will be nice to each other um, when given the chance. But I think they less and less get the chance to be nice to people who aren't like them or to know people who aren't like them. And that is that is causing this this fundamental rift into which this kind of distrust and this kind of abuse of the system that, that Trump has perfected um, can seep. Yeah, I mean, the election problems are downstream of the cultural problems here. I can fix the electoral problems, the ones that we actually have, but nobody cares because they don't think those are the real problems. Like very few people work this many campaigns to like actually see like, well, you know what, if we tweak this, this would make this better. You know, again, do the Carter Baker commission things require those. Uh, and we would actually fix 99% of any of the electoral problems out there, including Matthew's points, which I think are all well taken. But it won't fix trust in our elections because that's yeah. downstream from a larger trust problem, which we have data on that Americans trust each other less than they did um, 30 years ago and 60 years ago, et cetera. Okay. So we're quickly running out of time here. So I think I'd like to just um, go around the panel uh, one more time and ask each of you to maybe give some just brief final remarks, any key takeaways that you would like to mention, you know, 30, 45 seconds would be great if you can keep it to that. 
Uh, I didn't realize Megan and I were the same person until this panel, and it's been a real treat. So I will cede my time to her. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, oh, oh, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, no, I, you know, look, I think ultimately I said at the beginning that I think democratic norms are an elite truce and they don't actually have that much to do with the, the demos. Um, and I think that the way this is going to be fixed is by elites deciding that they want to call the truce. Um, and as we're looking at what's happening in Ukraine and Russia, um, we're, what we're looking at is the, the hard part is what's the off ramp, right? The hard part is how do you come to some accommodation and what makes people pull back rather than just thinking, well, if I just shell the next village, that's going to fix it. Um, and, but I think that that is ultimately the way out is that the elites on both sides have to stop fighting so hard for supremacy within their own coalition and have to rel relinquish the fantasy that they are just about to totally destroy the other side, right? That we are just, we are just one or more Hollywood movies away from just like all of the social conservatives in the country like vanishing into a puff of smoke um, and instead accept that look, all of these people are gonna be, the, that's something that you see in zones that have a lot of civil conflict. It's something you see in Northern Ireland. It's something you see in Israel is this like, this weird thing where you're in the conversation and then you just get to the point where you're like, what, what about the other people? Where are they? And they've just kind of vanished. They, we didn't kill them. They just aren't there anymore, right? That's not gonna happen. We're gonna keep being neighbors with people who aren't like us and we're gonna keep having these problems and they're gonna keep getting worse unless the elites who nominally or otherwise represent those other groups come together and decide we're killing each other, we're killing our country, and we need to do better, including telling the people on our own side who don't want to, who want to keep going for the total war, stop, we're not fighting with you anymore. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much more to add than Sarah and Megan. Um, you know, I, I do think um, Sarah's point about needing an external motivating moment. I mean, what we're seeing in Ukraine, I think, and maybe the, the rise of, of democracy again would, would be helpful. Um, so I think my, my main takeaway is you have three people, we come from kind of different perspectives a little bit, um, all diagnosing the same problem and yet no one, no one has a, a clear fix. Um, so it's probably not one fix. It's gonna take a couple of years, a couple of cycles to, to get back to good. At least I have some um, hope that that's possible. I mean, we, as, as Sarah mentioned, I mean, we, we do see um, an Electoral College Act moving through Congress, potentially. I, I don't know if we get, we get there, um, but Democrats and Republicans are talking um, because there was in, in 2021 exposed a, a real failure of democracy and, and maybe we can address that. And that, that's not the only problem. It's not gonna solve everything, but um, the fact that Democrats and Republicans can maybe focus on that um, at least gives me some hope. Thanks, Matt. Um, so before we close here, um, just want to put in a quick plug for our next policy and practice seminar, which is coming up in a couple of weeks time, um, March 17th, um, with a very British sounding name, and uh, it's entitled The Queen's Platinum Jubilee and the Future of the Monarchy. Um, the speakers are Bob Morris of UCL's Constitution Unit, Craig Prescott of Bangor University, and Carolyn Harris of the University of Toronto. So um, please do sign up for that and we'll look forward to, to the conversation. Uh, I wanna thank all of the audience members for coming tonight uh, as they do every week. We have a very loyal following here. And I especially wanna thank uh, the panelists for a terrific conversation. I was extremely excited um, to get all of these panelists um, Sarah and Megan, your uh, columns are really must reads every week. And Matthew, it's terrific to get your um, your comments here. So, so thank you very much, uh, uh, genuinely, for, for joining us. We really appreciate it. I think it was a great conversation. And we hope you'll, uh, you'll come back and see us again. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you.